Mark and I started researching legacy um, back in 2012. Um, and part of the reason we, we did is that we saw a lot of brands and headlines like you do see today um, that were going out of business, brands that have been around for a long time. Um, just this past few months, we've seen Toys R Us, Gibson Guitars, um, today Orchard Supply Hardware, um, Blockbuster actually had a couple stores in Alaska still open that nobody knew about but just closed. And the question arose, what is it about the current context, the current market, that's, um, that, that these long-standing brands that we thought would always be around are no longer here? Um, and we looked at cl closer at culture and saw that we live in a very short-term world right now. People are looking for instant gratification. They're looking for in overnight success. Um, we celebrate it in the media. And when we looked at the brands that were uh, actually building modern legacies, we saw different behaviors. So that was actually the inspiration for this book. Um, we'll be going back and forth tonight talk, or today talking a bit about this, uh, the stories in the book. And um, uh, we'll leave some time at the end for questions about, uh, about the material as well. But um, I'll, I'll turn it over to Mark just to share some of the original inspiration for the Legacy Lab, which is where this all started. Hi, I'm Mark. I'm a very uh, Canadian. Uh, my parents sent me here from Toronto and said, um, uh, you're a failed musician. Um, you seem to be failing in advertising. Maybe you could write a book and make the family proud of you. So the inspiration <laughs> for this is my parents kicked my ass to write a book. <laughs> um, in addition, uh, I have to be working on some business problems for two very iconic brands, the Lexus and the Ritz-Carlton. And one was coming up on being 25 years old, and one was coming up on being 30 years old. And they had a fundamentally different point of view on how they looked at their age, um, their success, where they'd been, where they were, where they were going. In the case of the automotive company, they felt that 25 years was too young to celebrate uh, all their success. They felt that if they said, look how far we've come in only 25 years, the brands like BMW and Mercedes would say, when you get to be 80, 90, or 100 years old, that's the moment when you should celebrate. But if you really want to re remark upon 25 years, um, we'll just pat you on the back and say, look how far you still have to go. And the iconic hotel company saw things in exactly the opposite way, which was at the age of 30, they felt that a 30 years old Ritz Carlton was too old to celebrate, that it was far better to be the Cosmopolitan, which was brand new, than the 30 year old Ritz Carlton. And I found that fascinating because so many um, uh, startup companies and entrepreneurs would come into our organization and say, how do you succeed like Lexus and Ritz Carlton in 25 and 30 years? And yet these brands did not know how to make sense of their own success. Concurrently, I uh, work at an agency called Team One. We work on Lexus and Ritz-Carlton, and we were going through our own sort of identity crisis, which is uh, we started um, in 1987, and um, effectively still a modern agency, but the world was transforming all around us. As you know, um, uh, social media companies were behaving like ad agencies, and entertainment companies were behaving like ad agencies, and ad agencies were behaving like media companies, and what we used to take for granted as being certain was changing dramatically. Um, and then probably most importantly, uh, I was about to become a dad uh, for the first time in my life, which was incredibly scary because I could barely take care of myself. So now I'd be having to take care of another life. And I was concerned that um, the example I wanted to set for my daughter wasn't just that I worked very hard, but to no end in specific, but that I worked very hard toward an end that was meaningful and important to me. And for that reason, I started looking at leaders of organizations that were building careers and building brands that had stories that I had admired, uh, many of which we cover in the book. But they weren't the ones who were simply doing things to make the greatest amount of money, but the ones doing things to make the greatest amount of contribution. So those were the ingredients that really inspired me to start researching this topic. And then I reached out to friends and colleagues and peers, including Lucas, um, who had a, a wonderful career as a writer and a researcher with Fast Company. And uh, I was hoping he'd share a little bit about, um, other than I bothered him to do it, why he bothered to help. Yeah, yeah. So um, Mark and I have been collaborating for over a decade. And um, I started my career back in 2002 at the Atlantic Monthly. Um, and that's a magazine that really invests in, in long stories. Um, while I was there, they actually published the longest story that they've ever published, which was three cover issues in a row that, um, that won a national magazine award that year on the unbuilding of the World Trade Center back in um, 2001. And 
Uh, so I came out of that space in journalism of, of really investing in stories, really telling what, what, um, what was behind what the mainstream media or the standard media would tell in a, in a, in a journalistic approach to a story, to, to going on to Fast Company, where Fast Company was a, a publication that was all about telling personal stories in the business world, really getting into the leaders behind the brands. Um, whereas a Fortune or Forbes might talk about the numbers or the products more, Fast Company was really interested in the, the culture and the people that built those brands. So when Mark started describing a project about legacy, uh, my ears perked up. I knew that was something that um, really resonated with readers. And when I actually got on the ground working with some of the interviews, I was hearing things that I rarely ever heard in, in journalism. Um, people would describe for us a variety of stories throughout their life, and at the end of the interview say, hey, can I get a transcript of this? I've never talked about a lot of this stuff. Um, and these were CEOs who'd been interviewed you know, countless times throughout their career. So I knew that we were asking about something that was very important. Um, whether you ask somebody young or old about legacy, they have some very personal, meaningful things to share um, about the way they see their life, the way they see meaning and significance. Um, so it, it was a very rich topic to uh, in, in invest our time in. Um, and uh, well, what was, what was interesting from there is that it wasn't just our personal interest. I mean, we, we started to see um, that there were leaders uh, who also wanted to uh, share that, share that um, the story of their legacy. So what we thought we would do over the course of the next um, 15, 20-ish minutes is walk you through some of the key principles that we've learned from the leaders that we spoke to. Um, we'll top line the five key chapters, the five key principles, and tell you some iconic stories that we'd love to share. Certainly at the end, if you have questions, um, we'd be happy to take them. If they're easy questions, we'd be even happier. If they're hard, <laughs> we'll probably say, oh, that's a really good question. We'll get back to you, and we may or may not. Um, so the first chapter in the book is about taking leadership personally. And um, as a bit of an anecdote, I went to uh, business school. And the reason that matters is because I remember uh, talking to my parents distinctly at one point and said, I'm thinking that um, for higher education, I may go uh, to film school um, or I may go to business school. And they said, well, you should do whatever you want as long as you go to business school. So I did that, and one of the first lessons they taught at business school is what is the responsibility of a business today, to which the answer was maximize shareholder revenue. They never talked about taking leadership personally. In fact, they said leadership is organizational, it's not personal, and the only responsibility you have is to maximize a shareholder return revenue. Um, and yet, the leaders that we spoke to speak beautifully and prolifically about the things that drive them, and seldom, if ever, did they begin conversations with I had an idea that I wanted to make a billion dollars and sell my company. They always began with a problem that they were trying to solve or a quality or an attribute that they wanted to put into the world. And the Tribeca Film Festival was a story that I happened to fall in love with. As I said, I grew up in Toronto. The Toronto Film Festival was a major event. And I was always curious to know in a cluttered, cloudy field of Sundance and Cannes in Toronto, how does a modern festival like Tribeca pop up and succeed? To which the answer from the founders of Tribeca, De Niro and Rosenthal and Hatkoff, was the world didn't actually need another film festival. And so if all we were creating was a film festival, this would have failed. And whereas the world didn't need another film festival, the world did need the Tribeca Film Festival. And I'll share with you the story they shared with me. The three of them grew up in and around New York. They happened to love film. They were people of means and people with tremendous influence. Um, who at one point toyed with the idea of introducing a film festival into New York because that was their lifelong passion, but they never really saw a hole in the conventional landscape. It just didn't make sense. And then 9-11 happened. And here you have some people that weren't just filmmakers, but had a deep care and consideration for the city that was home. And they observed from where they sat as people with means and influence that if people weren't going out and patronizing the businesses that were still around, that not only would New York feel um, devoid of life and vitality, but as commerce would dwindle, the city would get worse, not better over time. And so they went out to restaurants, and they thought, what if we could get more of our friends who also have influence and means to come out with us? And they created a program called Dinner Downtown. This existed before the Tribeca Film Festival was ever born. And all they did was they said, um, you, my friend, you should come to dinner, and you should invite 10 of your friends and let's keep doing the same thing. And so they grew an event, which they ran on more than one occasion, where hundreds of people, very influential people, including Bill Clinton and uh, Queen Noor, would come and patronize the restaurants. And what they observed was, if this is what we can do with small application, 
could we somehow scale that to impact more of the city of New York? They actually, their language was, they thought about contribution before they ever thought about extraction. And the contribution they wanted to make was more people in New York coming out, patronizing, consuming, um, adding vitality and culture, and they simply used film, the thing they knew really well, as a galvanizing mechanism to do it. Um, they made a lofty promise. It was uh, close to the end of the year, and they basically said four months into 2002, the Tribeca Film Festival would be born. They led with their hearts, they led with their passion, they led with their ambition, um, but they weren't fully mature thinkers. They didn't actually think it all the way through in terms of how do we get money for this thing? How do we communicate this thing? How do we make sure that not only are hundreds of friends now, but thousands of people and more from around the world? And it wasn't until very late in the game, they were about to call a media conference and cancel their idea or suspend it for a while, that they got an unanticipated phone call from American Express that said, we heard what you guys were doing, and let us tell you that as citizens of New York and people who were impacted tragically by the disaster 9-11, we have a passion and commitment to revitalizing the city too that transcends conventional commerce. We want to help you make this festival real. And one of the first questions that American Express asked the founders of Tribeca is, but we need to know your three and five year plan. To which their answer was, we don't have a three to five year plan. We don't even know how we're going to raise a million dollars to market this thing. Um, and so they collaborated. American Express had been their partner for a number of years. They built the program from the ground up. Today it's far more than a film festival. There are storytellers, there are um, storytellers in film, there are storytellers in literature. They use high technology to advance storytelling as well. They're toying with the idea of taking film out of the name of the festival. And they see Tribeca as being much more of a cultural event. And even though the city to the casual onlooker looks healed in, in a sense, um, they don't ever imagine a scenario where New York will not need the assistance and support of a program like Tribeca to bring more attention and community and interest in the city. They make a reasonable amount of money. They have very healthy, iconic partners, automotive partners, and so on, that put a good amount of capital into the program. But each year, they begin with, what positive impact do we want to have on the city of New York? And as a consequence, everything falls out of that. And I loved how we summed it up in the book, which is to say, they're people who take leadership personally. They're people who take work personally. They don't talk about maximizing shareholder revenue. They're looking at a higher order return, which is personal satisfaction, gratification, cultural rejuvenation, and more. So from long-term personal ambition, which is the, the first chapter, to behaving your beliefs, which is the second chapter, you have a, um, kind of the arc of, we, you can have one person with a long-term personal ambition or a dream, but rarely do you see modern legacy builders who do it alone. We see groups and teams that build around values and beliefs. So the second chapter focuses on beliefs and values. And traditionally, what you see up in the business world today with uh, brand managers or business managers is they're accustomed to saying one thing and doing another. Um, fortunately, we live in a more, more and more transparent world. Consumers are demanding that the brands that they purchase, the brands they follow, actually have, you know, have the same values that they do. Um, and, and those are what we would call modern legacy brands. And, and one of those is um, the Bluebird Cafe. Um, Bluebird Cafe is in Nashville. It's one of the most famous country music venues in the world. Um, like Tribeca, it didn't start out um, uh, with its modern realization. It started out as just a, just a restaurant, had a lunch service, and there was no music. Um, and it was 1982, and the founder, Amy Curland, um, had inherited a small amount of money from her grandmother and decided to open this cafe. And as the years went by, she said, you know, I want to educate myself about how to run a business. And she went to community college and took a variety of courses. And the one that really stuck to, for her was a marketing course where they instructed her to do one thing really well. And uh, what she realized about her cafe is that she'd, she'd let her boyfriend play at the, at the cafe once he was in a band. Um, they'd set up a small stage. And she realized that people were really gravitating towards the music. So over time, the lunch service was dropped. They doubled the evening uh, performances so that they'd have a performance for new, new musicians as well as musicians who were established. And it really took off. And she had to stick to that as the brand grew because she only had 100 seats in this place. She could have taken it somewhere else into a bigger location and um, really essentially sold out and made a lot more money with this. But it would have destroyed this vision of this brand that she had where she had created a listening space for 
artists who walked in off the street. Um, Garth Brooks got off a bus and actually got his first uh, album signed at the Bluebird Cafe. Taylor Swift launched her career. Those are the kind of artists that come back even as the, with their fame and have these tiny performances in front of 100 people at this place. So she, over the years, was able to maintain the sanctity, basically, of, of this listing space. Um, and it's telling the motto of the Bluebird Cafe is shh. Like they, they basically create this space where they don't want people to, to speak while the, the performers are performing. Um, so they'll have, you know, bachelor, bachelorette parties will call and say, can we, can we book a bunch of seats? And they'll say, yeah, but you, you can't talk. You, you're allowed to come, but you're not allowed to make any noise. Um, so they hold very true to this value. Um, and to the degree that when Amy Curlin looked to retire in the past few years, she decided rather than sell the brand for the most possible amount of money, she would donate it to the Nashville Songwriters Association. Um, so she called up a former employee of the Bluebird who worked there and um, said, hey, listen, I know that whoever takes this over won't be able to protect it like you guys could. What if I just donate it to you and you continue it in the tradition that I set up? And they said, we'll pay you a fair price for it, and took it, took it over, and, and in fact, have even carried its fame forward while maintaining the culture that she built. Um, there was a show um, called Nashville that you may have heard of. The Bluebird is essentially a character in that show. Uh, whenever they're looking to bring the drama down, um, they, they have a performance in the Bluebird. Um, and the Bluebird now has performances um, in London on uh, a pretty regular basis. They have performances in Sundance every year. So the brand has uh, grown organically, uh, but it has stayed true to that core value, that, you know, that belief in protecting this space where musicians can perform and be heard, not only famous musicians, but people who are trying to start their careers. Um, so that, that is the, kind of the, the second circle or second chapter of the book that builds out from the long-term personal ambition. Do you want to talk about the third? Yeah, so we begin with taking leadership personally, and we move into this notion of behaving your beliefs. Uh, the next section of the book gets into this idea of letting outsiders in, and the iconic story we'd like to share is a brand um, and a platform you may have heard of called It Gets Better, uh, which was developed by Dan Savage. And what's amazing about it is, um, by conventional standards, it should never have worked because they never designed a program which was, here's the inner workings, these are our consumers, and here's what we control, and here's what they take because we've packaged it that way. From the get-go, their intention was to create an idea and unleash it upon the world, and their language was to become very uncomfortable with the idea, or rather, to become very comfortable with the idea of being uncomfortable. Um, they didn't care that people were going to take their idea and mess with it. In fact, that was their design. So the famous story goes like this. And in around 2010, a young man named Billy Lucas uh, was bullied at school for being different, that the other kids perceived him to be queer. And they bullied him to the point that he killed himself. And not only was that a sort of horrific outcome and story, but the same kids that bullied him went onto his Facebook page after he died and continued to effectively bully him and insult him in front of his family. And that enraged um, a journalist by the name of Dan Savage that had a popular column called Savage Love. And he wrote an enraged post, which is, it's horrible that these young kids would make another boy or any young person feel um, so badly for being different that they would want to kill themselves. And a reader of the story wrote back and said, I wish I knew you, Billy Lucas, because I would have told you that it gets better. That effectively, as life moves on and you have the benefit of perspective and as you get uh, an older, sort of wiser point of view, you'll realize that these are silly, foolish kids that shouldn't have had this kind of impact on you. And that language stuck with Dan and him and his partner, Terry Miller, um, created a video. And so they did something that was very modern at the time. They used social tools that other programs and platforms were ignoring to say, we don't need to be censored. We can just put out in the world what we think. And their idea is they would record a video um, suggesting what life would look like from the point of view of an adult with wisdom. And they were hoping that maybe they'd get 10 other videos or 100 other videos. And what, of course, transpired is 1,000 video responses in a week, uh, more than 60,000 video responses uh, currently, more than 60 million views of those videos currently. And some pretty influential people have taken control um, from Obama. Um, to Lady Gaga, to popular culture and programming like The Office did a piece on It Gets Better as well. And Dan had talked about how even other advocate groups had a real problem with the fact that these guys were using social media to tell their story and reach young kids. And his point was, um, I embrace the ideals and the values of creating change, but if modern technology and tools have evolved to allow me to reach more, why would I not use them? That's just, those are rules, but they're bad rules, so let's change them. 
He also talks passionately about what he calls making a doable difference. And his belief is, in the world of advocacy, too many brands ask consumers to do things that sound like the impossible. If only we could raise a billion dollars. If only we could collect this amount of blood. If only we could take this amount of guns away and people feel powerless in that conversation. And his point was to unleash ideas and tools that made people feel that they could participate and that they could have a hand. His language was give people the opportunity to make a doable difference. And as a consequence, it, get, it gets better, continues to grow. We, we talked to him about the notion of, do you ever imagine a world where we won't need an it gets better? And he said, no, the form may change, but the notion of hate seems like it will persist. So we're always going to need tools and the benefit of wisdom from adults who can say, this is how you deal and cope. And his point of view on calling it gets better a brand is, He's against it. He doesn't think the old confines and rules of branding and organizations are what helps us uh, succeed. He thinks you need to set it free in the world. So if chapter one was about taking leadership personally and chapter two is around behaving your beliefs, the third chapter is really about unleashing ideas in the world, enrolling consumers as owners of ideas, and effectively, I think the language we use is letting outsiders in. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So from that, we branch into chapter four, which uh, talks about unconventionality, um, staying different. Um, the story that we wanted to share with you guys today is about the Belmont Steaks. This is a brand that's 150 years old. Um, kind of like the original must-see event in America. It's the third race in the Triple Crown, so it gets a lot of attention, especially when there's a Triple Crown race up for grabs. And well, the, one of the issues that the, the Belmont Steaks and all of horse racing is facing is that horse racing has kind of lost a generation of fans. Um, it's uh, not nearly as popular as the NBA or the NFL. There are a lot of sports that have drawn people away. Um, for, for a variety of different reasons. So Chris Kay, the re-founder of the Belmont Stakes, which is a, a term we use for people who've come to take over brands um, uh, after they've been around for a while, um, had his hands full when he came on board in 2014 looking at what can we do to get people either to stick with the sport or to come back into the sport. Um, so we start the story in the book in 2014 with the racing of the, the 2014 Triple Crown. California Chrome was up for grabs, uh, up for the Triple Crown. Didn't actually win. And so the disappointment was uh, magnified by the fact that 110,000 people were at this event and couldn't basically get out. The train stations were not set up for that kind of crowd. Um, the, the roads were completely packed. Um, and Chris was in his first year running this event, said that something has to change. So the following day, um, he did what a traditional brand manager would not do. I think a traditional brand manager would look for ways to cut money out of the system and sell tickets, sell as many tickets as possible. So maybe we can invest in you know, more seating. Um, he decided we're going to sell fewer tickets next year, and we're going to invest in, in making this a better experience for the people who come, both who see it on television as well as who come to the event. So um, of course, things like um, HD cameras and HD televisions were you know, deployed all around the um, stadium where the event's held, bringing the sport kind of up to the, the level that you see in the NFL and the NBA. Um, the experience was improved by, I think they cut maybe 20,000, something along that, around 20,000 uh, tickets out of the sales. So far fewer people came. It made it a more enjoyable experience for everybody that was able to come to the, to come to the race. Um, and really what he was looking to do was looking outside his category. So rather than stick to the conventions of horse racing and just copying what uh, the Kentucky Derby does, for example, he looked to what other major sports do, what Vegas does, um, looked to entertainment. Um, one of his best ideas that I love is he brought in a concert, um, an A-list um, band, I think the Goo Goo Dolls performed the very first time, um, right after the, um, the next year's Triple Crown race. That way, people stuck around even after the race. Some, some didn't actually get in their cars or hop in the trains and, and create as much congestion. So it's just these little touches that uh, really made the event that much better. Um, uh, probably m also notably, he expanded it from a one-day event to a three-day event so they could move the races out um, and have a big, you know, better distribution. So a as, as you look at the Belmont Stakes today, it's, it's far more modern, far more appealing to modern sports consumers than it was um, even just five years ago. Um, and so that, that really is about the, 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 the whole chapter talks about how you maintain that unconventional core that, that keeps people interested in your brand. So as we wander away into the fifth and final chapter of the book, the fifth and final principle of the book, we started really with it's all about a personal style and approach to leadership. We move our way to organizations enrolling themselves in those beliefs. 
where brand leaders have to behave their beliefs, and then organizations bringing outsiders in, and then behaving not with the orthodoxy, but against the ortho orthodoxy. The fifth and final chapter is pivotal because it really talks about not just doing things episodically, but doing things perpetually. Um, Lucas began today's conversation with reference to Gibson Guitars and Radio Shack and Brookstone um, and Neko Candy, brands that at one point in time had done something fascinating, but got stuck doing the same thing repetitiously over time. It didn't evolve. So instead of saying the values persist, but the manifestations change, they said the values persist and the manifestations persist as well and ultimately become less relevant. So the iconic story we like to tell here is Taylor Guitars. And as I shared at the outset, um, I'm a musician, a failed musician, but nonetheless, um, I grew up having a reverence for Taylor Guitars because it was a modern company that sort of came out of nowhere that unseated a brand like Martin Guitars, which had been around for a very long time. And the reason they've succeeded in their own words is because they always ask themselves, in 10 years, in 10 years from now, will we be happy that we make the choices that we made today? And if the answer is that in 10 years, they will be happier, more successful, more fulfilled, they make choices and decisions and service of a 10-year outcome. So if they have to change the way they distribute, they do it. They didn't buy into the distribution system in Europe. They knocked it down. They built their own distribution system. They learned about HR's policies in Europe. And they invested the time and money to do it because they felt that owning their own distribution channel would make a difference. If they didn't like the way materials were being manufactured in their guitars, they invested in factories in Cameroon. And they got involved in fair work practices and fair wages. And so they weren't just making guitars. They were impacting the way that guitars were being made from the outset. And they have a lovely point of view that the way you carry ideas forward for generations is you enroll the people who work with you as family and co-owners as well. So I'll give you some examples that they shared with us. When the economy went to bad, rather than laying off a substantial portion of their workforce, they cut everyone back to four days, and they got the group together. And instead of saying, some of you keep your jobs and some of you lose your jobs, they said, we want everyone to continue to be a part of it, so we're all going to work four days, not five. And what they did not tell their workforce is in the background, they were keeping track of lost wages. When the economy went back to good, all those people who stayed with them through the four days got paid for that fifth day in each one that they lost wages for before. Um, the other thing that they've subsequently done, which for us was fascinating, and we got a lot of questions from the press about it, is in real time, they're picking the successor of their brand today who's cross-training with the founder of the organization. So what they had observed is a lot of guitar companies, and Gibson's uh, a perfect example, look to build in volume and take cost out of the system. So if Gibson once started as the consequence or passion of someone who wanted to build beautiful guitars, it became the output of a marketing organization that would distribute widely and distribute cheaply. And their point of view is eventually that system is going to run out of steam because what made brands like Fender and Gibson so special wasn't wide distribution and cheap costs, is that those brands actually had a story to tell and values that they held dear. And so their point of view is they're not going to sell to the highest bidder. They're going to turn employees into co-owners of the brand, and they're going to build their successor today. So a guy named Andy Powers uh, was found um, after a long search. He works with Bob Taylor. They're designing guitars together today, and it's in his contract, effectively, that when Bob Taylor moves on, Andy can't just reissue the old guitars that are made today. He has to design and build new guitars in the spirit of what Taylor's always about. He has to bring the brand forward. Contractually, it's also his responsibility to find the next successor. So Andy, contractually, can't just come in one day and say, I hate this place, or I'm done with this place, and I'll see you later. In real time, just as Bob Taylor has done, he has to find a successor and train him or her and pass values and culture forward. And when you think about the brands that maybe you work with, and I think about the brands that maybe we work with, I can't tell you that, that that's a very common attitude in the slightest. The vast majority of the brands are concerned with today. The vast majority of brands are concerned with quarterly reporting, maximizing shareholder revenue. Um, it's the few, not the many, that think about growing cultures and values first and finding ways to perpetuate it forward. Um, we often get a lot of heads nodding and people saying, it sounds ideal and it sounds beautiful. Why is it that more brands are not behaving this way? To which the answer is because it's hard. Because when an economy goes to bad, you're inclined to save money, make more money, save money, um, sell more product, let go of staff to save on wages. And these are companies that are doubling down on culture. Uh, Lucas reminded me that Ritz Carlton actually had a lovely solution. When the economy went to bad, they ran a campaign that said to wealthy people, um, the ones who retain their wealth ish, um, 
if you can't take the vacation that you want this year, you shouldn't go on vacation. Don't just spend money because you think to, you need to, to spend it. Um, don't go on future vacations um, to save and only to save. They effectively said get your priorities right in life. Think about the things that matter most. Where things matter most, spend more time and money there. And where things matter least, save your money, invest your time elsewhere. And those are brave things for brands to take a leadership point of view. The most surprising fact of that story is of all the brands in the Marriott portfolio, the Ritz-Carlton was the number one leading brand in the down years after recession. The brand that charged the most, where really a person could say, I could get a room anywhere, a bedroom anywhere, a conference room anywhere, I could sleep in any hotel, I don't need to go there. They got more revenue per available room night from customers because they held tight to their values and they came out recession on top. Um, so I'll turn it over to Lucas to sort of sum up the stories. Um, we have another little piece at the end that we'll talk about quickly and, and very happy to answer uh, questions. It's a topic we're very passionate about. And it's amazing that in the time we've written the book, as Lucas said, Neco bankruptcy, Radio Shack bankruptcy. Second bankruptcy in three years. Blockbuster down to basically finally near done. <laughs> um, it's not a proud moment to say we're at the cusp of what's happening in the world around us because what's happening around us isn't a wonderful thing. Brands that we thought would be around forever are disappearing. Um, but it's a special thing to have knowledge from the ones who have found ways to thrive. So I'll turn it over to Lucas to, to sum it up. Yeah, yeah, so the, the beginning of the book process was really sitting down with all these lessons, all these stories, and starting to say, where are the common themes? Where are the chapter breaks? What, what, are, what are the takeaways for this? Um, and what we started to see was something we've come to call the modern legacy mindset, and that's the, the five core chapter ideas. Um, traditional brand leaders will follow organizational principles, institutional rules. Um, what we found modern legacy builders doing is following long-term personal ambitions. Um, that's the first chapter. Uh, traditional brand leaders will lean into saying one thing, doing another, a lot of attitude, a lot of posturing. Um, modern legacy builders really behave their beliefs and their values. Uh, the third chapter about letting outsiders in. Uh, traditional brand leaders follow a command and control model. Um, still a lot of, this is a very difficult thing for modern brands to do. Um, but modern legacy brands step outside of that and let outsiders in and really let consumers take a role in the brand. Um, and, and they build a lot of influence that way. Um, the fourth chapter, I talked about the Belmont Stakes. Uh, that's all about uh, being unconventional. Um, traditional brand leaders will stick to their category and follow the orthodox of, of the business that they're in. Uh, modern legacy brands are really willing to break the category, um, be a category of one, uh, and, and uh, define their own category. And the fifth chapter that Mark just spoke about with Taylor Guitars is about being perpetual. A lot of brand leaders will evolve episodically when they need to, um, repeating what they do well until it's absolutely necessary to completely change. Um, and what we see is that brands like uh, Gibson Guitars, Toys R Us, um, Blockbuster, uh, they wait too long. You know, it's a short-term mindset, and you wind up seeing them go, go bankrupt or out of business, um, brand leaders that are building modern legacies are evolving all the time. It's a constant process. I was going to add one of the, the questions we often get asked is, um, it all sounds so ideal, but do these companies make money as well, the ones that you studied? Uh, the balance, if not entirely, all the brands in the book are brands that are succeeding in not just cultural terms, but financial terms. I'll, I'll share a, a story and a half. One is, from a leader in the first chapter um, named Tony Ko, who launched a brand called Nix Cosmetics. And she had a very strong point of view that as a leader, of course you want to lead with culture and values, but you need to make money as well because money allows you to hire people, grow, pay healthcare. Who wants to work for a leader that tells you they don't want to make money? So our, our thinking philosophy is not do good and don't make money. Our philosophy, I think, very much is do good and as a consequence, other good things will happen, including making money. Um, the other piece that I want to share is um, the forward for the book um, is definitely worth reading. Um, we'll tell you how to get a copy of the book uh, next week. But if you haven't read the book and you just want to see a tease, we can send you a link. The forward from the book is now online. It was written by Yvonne Chouinard. He's the founder of Patagonia. And Yvonne, um, in the past year, became famous once again, he a famous guy, um, for posting on his for, for sale website, his commercial website, uh, the Patagonia brand, that the president just stole your land. And so you could agree with his politics or not. We're not taking a stand on that. Um, but what we will take a stand on is he's a guy that put his values out front. He said, my brand believes in nature and parklands and the ability to enjoy them today and for generations to come. And I perceive the government is threatening what my brand holds dear. And so right up on his homepage, he said, the president stole your land. 
as it turns out, in that same year, it was the most profitable year that Patagonia has ever had. So for the ones who question the value of um, good ethics and high ideals and long-term ambition, um, it, he is proof positive that you can do it at a very high level while being very successful as well. Um, the last thing that I'll leave you with before we sort of open up, if there happen to be questions, is um, we often get asked uh, by folks, how can they get involved in some of the work that we're doing? We never started out with the ambition of a for-profit business, but we've been approached about helping people with branding. So we do that gladly. Um, we didn't begin with the idea that we were going to write a book. We began researching in earnest. As I said, I was about to become a dad, and I want to learn from people that I admired. Um, and yet, it became such an interesting topic that every time we spoke to a leader, they'd refer us to a friend. They'd ask for a transcript because they never told the story before. Um, and so here are ways that you can get involved. If you have a story that you think is worth covering, um, please share it with us. The, the book has brands that are 100 years and older. It has brands that are 10 years and younger. It has brands that are 40 years old. Our philosophy is legacy is something you write every day because you're either writing it every day or you become a part of ancient history. People read what you once did. So if you know someone, please share it with us. If you happen to have a story that's your personal story, your work here, or a, a side hustle, um, share it with us. We're interested in that. The other thing that we've done is we've created a foundation. Um, so our commitment was, yet again, because we weren't doing this strictly to make money, or, or initially ever to make money, was that anytime something good happened, we'd reinvest it in people who live and work this way. So uh, two years ago, we ran a program called Legacy Honors. Um, David Remnick from The New Yorker was a recipient as a re-founder of the year, and before he collaborated on our book, Yvonne was a founder of the year. Um, and they got bursaries that they passed forward to businesses that they felt should persist for a long time. So Yvonne gave $10,000 to Doctors Without Borders because he felt that healthcare is a basic human right, and if you're an adventurer, you may need healthcare at some point. And David gave his to the Committee to Protect Journalism because he felt in the environment that we operate in, journalists were not getting the fair due, and they were putting their lives on the line, and he passed $10,000 forward to them. Next week, on the 28th of the month, Almost right around the corner at our agency called Team One, uh, with Inc. Magazine, we're announcing the first ever young, effectively young legacy makers, the ones who don't have fully formed and established businesses, but who are making active change to the way culture and society work and behave today. There are five recipients. Um, there are two young activists who are 11 years old who've been in the news a fair amount recently. There are two slightly older but still young activists um, who've got notoriety um, on a Forbes list. Um, and there's a young, interesting um, filmmaker who's got notoriety at the Sundance Film Festival. Um, we're passing forward grants to them as well. So if you're curious to come hear more, either more about the book, and we're giving away free copies of the book if you'd like that evening, um, or to hear the stories about the young legacy makers, we'd love to have you or your colleagues and peers come and join us. And with that, on behalf of Lucas and me, um, I just want to say thank you for giving us some of your time today and joining us. Thanks, guys. <laughs> We have some time for questions. If you have a question, I will toss this in your direction and pass on the microphone. Want to catch it? No, this is good. Okay. This is the microphone. Oh, it's a <laughs> yes. <laughs> I have like three questions, but I'll, uh -huh. I'll ease into them and give other people a chance. Um, it was a really interesting talk. Um, I'm, I'm wondering how much the advancement of technology um, and you know the internet and how much uh, that has made things move much more quickly has um, impacted maybe the newer brands that are trying to establish in terms of uh, their ethics and their morals um, because if they're not ethical then and people discover that then it becomes like a wildfire on the internet to say like this is the, you know, the unscrupulous way in which this brand is doing business and that can cause them to fail a lot faster. Can you, can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, actually, uh, Mark can speak a little bit more on the client side, but I can say that um, right out of the gate, we had an assumption when we published this book and, and the, started doing the work that we were doing that the types of brands that would approach us would be the, the longstanding brands, the brands that were in, at, at, in, in trouble of going out of business and wanted to preserve their legacy. Um, what we found is actually there's it, it, the majority of the brands that approach us are the younger brands, the, the newer brands, um, and, and sometimes brands that are, are uh, very popular. They've got some great product, 
but haven't spent the time to say, what, what are we about? Like, what, what, do, what do we do? You can actually share, if you want to share that, that text story, um, that's probably relevant to this. At the, uh, the front of the first chapter, is that what you're thinking of? I'm thinking of the, the consulting yeah. uh, uh, prior to the book. So there's a company that may or may not be in this neck of the woods um, <laughs> that uh, likely works in the tech space that came with an interesting proposition, which was um, they could tell us what they were building that night, um, but they had a hard time thinking about what they were building in the future. And it became particularly relevant for them because as they were looking to mature as an organization, they had investors who were asking hard questions of them, which is, in a sea of companies that are popping up overnight with interesting things, why is yours worth backing? And their honest um, assessment of it was they did not know how to answer uh, that question. Um, and that became incredibly important, and that's fairly common, which is we see plenty of people who walk into the agency who say, my goal is I'm going to start a company, sell it for a billion dollars as fast as I can, and then I'm done. And our endeavor is actually to say our thinking is not for those people. Our thinking is not for everyone. Um, technology is changing. Things are moving at a fast pace, but it's not permission to not have a long-term ambition or a goal. So the ones who define their businesses only by the hardware um, are the ones who are most likely to be copied and imitated quickly at a lower price. And the ones who say the hardware is simply a manifestation of a larger idea are the ones who have an opportunity to last for a longer period of time. The, the other story that I'll add very quickly is at the start of our first chapter, the start of all our chapters, we ripped stories at a culture. So the vast majority of stories that we covered are based on primary research, but at the front of every chapter you find what was supposed to be an iconic leader that everyone in the world would agree is making the kind of positive change that it eases you into a chapter. So right at the start of chapter one is Mark Zuckerberg from Facebook. And we wrote about him before, of course, the questions came out about um, transparency in, in data. Um, and so we've subsequently been asked questions about the degree to which we stand behind the story. And we, we have the same answer and we feel strongly about it, which is we didn't write the history book on brands that forevermore are doing exceptional things. We covered a moment in time where leaders and brands were doing exemplary work. And if they want to be in the next book, they would continue to hold fast to the values that got them there. And if they abandoned them, they likely wouldn't be in the, in the next book. So we actually found it not, um, it, it was a fascinating thing, which is it forced us and the readers of the book and the press as well to confront the reality that we weren't talking about people who should be famous for what they once did. We're talking about people who live by their words every single day and help to write history every day. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you. Um, in a similar vein, you talked about uh, Blockbuster and Radio Shack, who yeah. their business model kind of <laughs> went away. Uh, but there's a lot of theories about how they could have pivoted or recontextualized to still exist. So are there examples of companies that kind of maintained their legacy and values while having to change what they did pretty fundamentally? It's interesting you say that. The, the, the story that we also put in the book at the very beginning is Kodak, too. We kind of bunched those three together as cautionary tales. And I love the Kodak version as a cautionary tale because they actually invented the digital camera back in like 1974. And somebody brought it to an executive and the executive said, this would ruin our photo business. We, we have printing booths everywhere. That's all our revenue. Like This is not something that we want to put out there. So they, they buried the invention and ultimately it was their demise. Um, so it's a, it's a fascinating little case study. Um, as far as um, brands that have transitioned, what, what I do think is interesting is uh, some of the brands in the book will come to us and say, uh, The Honest Company is a good example. They're right here, right around the corner. They, they'll tell you, we build these products, you know, where we, we sell these products, um, but tomorrow we could be selling something entirely different because it's the values and our mission um, aren't necessarily about the products. Um, the Honest Company, for example, is about a cleaner, greener world. Um, they could be making clothing next year. It would still stay true to that principle. They would just be doing that in a different industry. I've, I've been surprised by how many times we've heard that. Um, but you, can you think of examples or? Um, uh, Ritz Carlton's another reasonable one, which is in response to the question, in 100 years from now, what do you hope persists? One of the founding members was very reflective, and he said, if the hotels look the same, and if people dress the same, and if people um, act in exactly the same way, then people fundamentally misunderstand what this brand is all about. We're about ladies and gentlemen treating people as ladies and gentlemen. We're about graciousness and manners in a world that is often without them. And to a degree, we're about creating memories that last a lifetime. Um, so it's not just about a two or three night stay. It's about a, a seven memory stay, for, for example. And his point was, we teach culture and value every day. 
And that's why today we have hotels and tomorrow we're going to have yachts and beyond that, um, the Ritz-Carlton might manifest as something fundamentally different than a conventional hotel company. They got an interesting phone call from um, a documentarian, uh, a group that was making a, a documentary. And they said, we're going to cover Airbnb and we're going to cover the Ritz-Carlton as examples of um, iconic, successful hospitality spaces today. And their question was, which hotels do you want us to document? And the Ritz-Carlton said, um, effectively, we don't care. And they said, what, what do you mean? Which are the hotels you want to show off? And they said, any of them and none of them, because what defines us and are not the walls, we'll tell you the people that we'd like you to document it, because we think the people and the style of service is the thing that lives on. And it took the media company a while to digest it, but when they understood, they said, yeah, I guess that what, that's what makes you an Airbnb fundamentally different. One's about the spaces you occupy, and one's about the human interactions you have no matter where you go. And they said, yes, that's what we hope lives for 100 years, those human interactions. Um, so over time, we'll look to plus those stories. But I think Honest is one in the making. I think Ritz as a brand that's um, more than 30 years old is probably not a bad one. And um, it'd be curious to see what happens with brands like Bluebird over time. Um, they're a fascinating story. They refuse to knock down the walls and make it a venue for thousands of people. They say that if the performers can't see the audience, the experience dies. And yet they're looking for ways to transport that experience all over the world that doesn't violate their culture and values. So that'll be a curious one. Mm -hmm. Anybody else? Question about legacy when it comes to um, industries making significant shifts. So like you guys are from Team One, automotive industry is working to be like more <laughs> mobility focused instead of selling cars. And like that's a that's a hard right, right? Like that's not like a, oh, let's think about this. They're trying to do it really quickly. Mm -hmm. um, what's your guys' take on legacy when there's companies that w are trying to take on things that might be outside of their zone? Mm. Well, I, I can speak to automotive directly, which is um, that world is changing so dramatically um, that I believe if you sat down with Akio Toyota, he would tell you mobility um, it isn't a made-up idea that he would say mobility was always a part of the DNA. Maybe it was not at the top of the pyramid. Maybe it wasn't always discussed and revealed. But he would tell you the way they move people through the world, including how they move people through a dealership, how they move people through an online experience, how they move people from home to work and beyond. He, he would tell you it's a part of the truth of the company. One, one of the supporters of our book that we're quite proud of is Simon Sinek. And when Simon got involved, um, he was skeptical at first. He said, I'm sure you're talking to a lot of people who are telling you fairy tales and fantasies about what they wish they would become, but don't represent the truth of what they are. And once we started dissecting the stories and going through them, he, he became uh, a, a fan, particularly of the Fast Company story. Um, and I think he particularly liked the Taylor story. But he really challenged us, as you're, you're appropriately doing, which is to say, are you guys just showing the shiniest pieces that companies want you to see, um, or these real elements of the brand? So for automotive specifically, I think Toyota has some truth in the notion of mobility. And what they look like tomorrow better be fundamentally different than today because otherwise they'll be dead and gone. Yeah, totally. I just I look at Mark Fields and what they were doing with Ford and it's like, you know, the Ford Pass totally tanked, right? And it's like how how are you gonna do this the right way? And it is it's a it's a big change, right? So the, you're right about the DNA of Toyota always being about mobility, but it's like how do you do it the right way and how do you buy yourself enough time? Uh, which is another key piece of it. Like when you're talking about switching from going from selling cars or whatever it may be to whatever shift you're doing as a company, like how much of a period of time do you need to change, even if it is part of your legacy, change to the dynamics of your business? We, I'll shut up now. We write, we write a piece in the book right at the end that talks about the old measurement system was a simple evaluation of assets and liabilities. So in a quarter, in a year, what are the things that hold value? What are the things that are losing value? And we've worked with a semiotician in London and built a model which is concurrently looking at latent value, those things that still have value, but if you don't evolve it, it becomes useless, and concurrently looking at the things that you change in real time, because if you're not looking ahead and creating things that don't exist, you're going to find out that your Lexus is unseated by Tesla and Blockbuster is unseated by Netflix because they never bother to pay attention. and. Ritz-Carlton could be unseated by Airbnb because they relate to the timeshare game. Yeah. So we do think it's a fundamental shift. On the one hand, the, the idea that um, repeat the past. If I just do that, I can't fail. M many understand that. Even if it fails, who could say that I was wrong for doing what once worked? Equally, we see the ones who say, 
Um, screw the past. The past was in the past. I'm here for my three year tenure as a CMO or CEO. It's a whole new future. I'm going to make my mark, build my resume, and move on. The hardest thing is to actually reconcile the two. What are the pieces of the past worth hanging on to? And what are those elements of modernity that we better add or we're going to fail? So I think we have good examples of brands in the making. And I think this is going to be a constant work in progress. Yeah. Thank you. Appreciate your time.